We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And this is part two of the one that we started last week, which was part one on running therapy groups. And this one is about the styles of running therapy groups, the different styles that we can use in that. Uh, because we felt like there was a bit too much information in last week, so we decided to split it over to. Yeah, and thank you very much for allowing me to have the opportunity to talk about my many years of experience uh, of running psychotherapy groups and the different types of psychotherapy groups. And what I'd like to concentrate specifically in this, and he said video of a podcast, is um, I'd like to talk about what a process group is. Yeah, a hybrid individual group, which I talked about last uh, podcast, and the group I ran for so many years, which was basically a hybrid one, which is where the individual becomes the star in the the group, not not the people in the group. Yeah, and there's a huge difference. Yeah. Massive. I think the one that I did was a hybrid, you know, there, yeah, there was, definitely. yeah, definitely. absolutely. Definitely. So here we go then, <clears throat> a process group, and there's different types of process groups. So perhaps we'll lead a third, <laughs> a third podcast. <laughs> anyway, loosely, loosely, a process group is one where the leader of the group is trained and will facilitate the group as a process. In other words, it's not going to be an individual that is the star of the therapy group. The curative factor will be the process of the group. Okay. Does that make, is that clear? I think- In other words, <laughs> in, other words in other words, the is the issues that the individuals bring into the group collectively so it's a we and not an i okay. it's co-constructed co-created rather than an individual process so the um leader will be concentrating on the different factors of the group and the themes of the group the system of the group rather than an individual process. Okay. Is so that... one person brings a topic and then everybody discusses that theme or topic. Is that what you mean? Okay. This is why I said there's different styles of running a group. But in general, <clears throat> in general, it's about processing whatever happens collectively in the group. Okay. So, for example... You know, if you were trained in group dynamics and trained in running a psychotherapy group in the way that I'm talking, you might well start the group this way. Once you've sorted out whether it's one hour, whether it's two hours, whether it's three hours, how many people in the group, the group contract, when you've sorted all those admin things out, <clears throat> such as, for example, is it for 10 weeks and is it for 20 weeks? Is it for ongoing? When you've sorted all that stuff out, a, a group dynamic process facilitator might walk into the group and say something like this. Okay, so we have two hours now. Over to you. Wow. <laughs> And just like we are, just like we are now, or you are. <laughs> if you could see it, you could see Jackie's face. <laughs> um, um, but exactly. <clears throat> when a, a long, long time ago, I'll keep coughing. <clears throat> a long time ago, before I became a psychotherapist, 
probably 32, 33. I was I was interested very much in learning about myself a little bit more. That doesn't mean I'd gone into therapy because I hadn't. So I must have been 32. And I did a I did a 10 week course one of the what is called the extra extra mule part of Manchester University. I don't know if it's still called the extra mule part. This is God, this is 45 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever. Yeah, 40 years ago. Um and it was called, I think, group group dynamic, a taste of group dynamics or something like that. And I can't remember what the actual taste was. It was for two hours, or was it an hour and a half? And um, that's exactly what happened, what I'm saying now. And um, the person basically said what I've just said and then shut up. I think it was for an hour, actually, and then just was quiet. And whatever people bought, people bought. Now, I knew nothing about psychotherapy. I was a virgin to all of it. I was learning about myself. So I found it intellectually interesting. I found it, I was pretty stunted emotionally and various other things. Looking back on it now, I thought it was very extremely, un only from where I am now, I thought it was quite unprotective. Yeah. Because it wasn't deemed a therapy group. It was deemed a taste of group dynamics, I think. So it's a completely different process. And people stayed or didn't stay or left out. But I, what I didn't think happened, uh, you know, there wasn't a sort of teaching really about what it was all about. Yeah. And, I, and in many ways, I think there was missing things for it. But why I'm bringing this up is that if you decide to go into a therapy group, which is a run process style. It could be by a group dynamic therapist. It could be very similar in the sense that, okay, the contract might have been worked out before the group contract, the structure, the time admin. It could be very similar where the person just says over to you. Now, different from what happened with me 45 years ago, which was a taste in group dynamics, I think in a further education university, if you're trained as being a therapist, it's up to the therapist then to come in. Whereas this person, 42 years ago, I'm talking about, never came at all because it hadn't got a therapeutic nature, even though I think it was therapeutic in some senses. But anyway, I won't go down that road. So the person who's been trained in group dynamics will come in. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And, and, <laughs> and sort of like, shape the way the process might be going yeah so there's the structure to it it's not just like a free-for-all when you no, you're no, going no, in this there is no, some structure yeah. yeah definitely okay so now i've just said that on the yeah. i'm going to go to another type of process group which i got trained in so i did transaction analysis training group training and for all those years i've told you about there well, I was 65, 64, I ran in a hybrid style. Towards the end of my uh, running group life, if you like, I got trained in what I'm going to talk about now, relational group process. So I'm adding the word relational in front of it. Yeah. And in fact, uh, whether it's a couple of months' time, wherever it is, I'm going to be running a relational group process at a conference and teaching off it. I, anyway, I learned and got trained in this. I was still running groups hybrid way and I didn't change it. If I was to come out of retirement now at 72 and run a psychotherapy group, I'd run it relational group process. I actually think it's harder to run. Okay. It needs a lot of training. And experience. Now, if people listen to this might disagree, and that's fine. I don't want to minimize um, how the training or how uh, some how difficulties or whichever way we're going to talk about this hybrid group therapy is. But I do want to say, running a relational group process no one needs training, but needs skill, and I think a person needs to be trained uh quite deeply in this and perhaps move up from individual therapy 
to, you know, get trained to be able to run groups in this way. So let's just talk about relational group process. So if I stepped out of retirement now to do it, I would take eight people. I probably have two hours. I probably get a contract for what that is a group group uh, relational process, and then what comes out of it. Uh, you know, I will make sure that I am involved, potent, and um, provide psychological protection in the group, uh, and we can debrief after it. Yeah. And I, out of the two hours, I probably do maybe an hour and a half while I'd have the actual group process and then I'd debrief from it. I think that's the way I'd do it. Okay. So the relational group process, number one, is an us and it's not an I. Okay. So it's always us. It's always built on co-creating, co-creation, construction, and a relational whole. And it's putting respect, uh, phenomenological inquiry as the methodology, involvement, potency, and a collective experience at the height of the one and a half hours process. So I'd probably start it by giving some educational principles out. Now, if I was running it regularly, I'm not going to say the same principles every week, obviously, but if I was to start one at the beginning, I would talk about the importance of collective collectiveness, the importance of transparency, the importance of genuineness, the importance of um, speaking and taking ownership of the I. In other words, if you are going to speak in the group, do you need to talk from your own experience and not speak for someone else because it's yeah. your experience and not somebody else's. If you're going to challenge somebody, you would do it respectively from an I'm okay, you are okay position. And I would talk about these sort of principles, and I'll talk about normalization. And I'll talk about the idea that if you trace back what any of these issues are about in context, they will all have meaning. And that, you know, normalization is part of the process where I will help make meaning of what might seem a crazy situation as normal in the context where those issues uh, came from. So I would, I would set principles for the group. Yeah. Like I'm talking about now. Um, I'll start the group, say over to you. But I would also um, be really important to involve myself in the relational group process. So if people, if some people were withdrawn, I might well say, um, when there was the right time, for example, I noticed that you're quite withdrawn in the group. Would you mind, you know, uh, is it okay for you just to um, let us know what's happening internally as you, with, as you're, so as, you know, what's happening internally from that withdrawn place. So I would, you know, be aware, a bit like a bit like a symphony. It goes up and down and there's a balance of crescendos and different things. So I would be always aware of the balance in the group. And so if one person's going to challenge another group, I will make sure there's a time for eternal experience and ownership of what's happening. Yeah. I'll be thinking of relational needs in the group that may or may not be met. And then I would involve myself in saying, maybe looking at how the past has been played out in this relational group process 
and what different coping mechanisms they might want in a different scenario or whatever it is. So I would, in other words, I would be playing an active role and involving myself in the success in the success of a relational group process. Okay. So everybody would hopefully have time to express their internal world, what's happening internally in an external protective collective group. Yeah. So when you start off and you say over to you, then one person would say, well, actually this week, um, I've had a bit of a conflict with my husband who came home from work and this happened and that happened. And then the other people would join in with their yeah. experience of so it. That, yeah. If that actually happened, I'll run through this. Yeah. So yeah. you said all that. I would then say, oh, unless you've had a difficult time. And as, as I hear you're sharing some of this internal process, what would you like from the group as you right. share? Okay. And then comes in and says, you know, when you said that, I felt a real hang in my heart because I've had, I really, I really have some identification with that and XXX. And then I might then keep with the person who said what they said to that they've had a hard week and say, oh, as this person says this, what's the impact of their care or whatever it is on your yourself? Right, yeah. And encourage that person to say something back and then encourage that person to say something back. And then if somebody else wants to come in, they might want to come in. Yep. Yeah. So starting to think of how the past gets presented collectively in the group and what the group or individual members of the group, how they respond in an empathic way or not. Yeah, because it, not everybody's going to react in an empathic way. And I, I was taking notes and one of the things that you said was respectfully challenge. So it's not like everybody has to be in total agreement with what people oh, are saying. No. It's about respectfully challenging. So somebody might say, for example, Oh, you know, when you said you were, had a really hard day and everything, I also see that you were laughing there and that really jolted me because that seems a real incongruence between the laughter and the real drudgery of the day. And I was wondering what that meant for you. And for me, it meant that I couldn't, I found it hard to take you seriously. Yeah. I can see it being quite a powerful experience to be part of, of that. Oh. Oh. Yeah, because we we do it naturally. Well, us women tend to do it naturally, where we, we ask for other people's opinion. Do you know what I mean? If we've got an issue, we often tend to talk about it with different groups of people, you know, our, our friends, our work colleagues, our families, whatever it is. So I suppose it's just a similar way of exploring that but in a safer therapeutic environment rather than just getting a load of random people's opinion on whatever it is is going on in your life at the moment well i think there's something specifically healing about energy a collective energy of a group yeah i think that's the dimension i really want to say and the other thing is the word relational is really important here I think there's a healing thing to a group if it's led in the right way. That's why I started. I think this that's out. the key to it is that there is somebody at the helm. It's like social media, you know, Facebook groups that say that it's a support group, but there's nobody actually leading the way and it just ends up a bitch fest or something. 100% correct. The, that's why I said at the beginning that the, the therapist of this type of group yeah. needs to be trained, needs to be active and very proactive in involving themselves. Absolutely. In the service of the protection of the members of the group. Yeah. Yeah. So you touched on it with this, and I'm kind of interested in this, but were you, are you saying that you're doing a training course on this? No, I did one. I, did, did I trained one. in integrative psychotherapy for 11 years with Richard Erskine. And then in that training, 
there was a whole training on relational uh, group therapy. Now, we're now into, I don't know, I'm 60 now. I've, I, I, I didn't want to change my groups, which have been running for a long time in a completely different style. When I look back at my career, and sometimes I wish I had, because I think I do see the power of Goulding's individual hybrid groups, but I really like the healing energy of a collective group. Yeah. Different way. Yeah. I'm I'm just I think I'm just curious because at the moment I'm seeing a lot of couples in therapy and I can see how this potentially is quite healing, you know, for the individuals to be in a group setting, to be able to talk and learning about relationships, different relationships, the relationship we have with ourselves as well as the relationships that we have with other people and how they can impact on us. Mm. So, so yeah, I can see it being really useful. It is. And, and and you might start with a theme with these types of groups. Um, you could start with a theme. You can say, well, what I'd like to perhaps have a theme of this, you know, relational group where it would be the concept of shame. And we come from a history where sh shame, you know, we often feel shame based on the teaching style in the, in the Western world is often we, we carry a lot of our shame with us. And I was wondering who would like to start? Yeah. So we could have themes to the each relational group process. I'm not going to bring a theme in. When I do this relational group inquiry and teach off it, I'm just going to start. I'll start with the principles like I have now, and then I'll just say over to you. But I do know that in terms of protectiveness, I have a very involving, protective, involving and proactive style. Yeah. And I think it's really important in this that, you, that the therapist also is relational. You know, it's like it's your part, all of you, including the therapist, is part of a relational whole. And the therapist is the leader in many ways, like the, or, you know, the leader of an orchestra. Yeah, the conductor, yeah. If you like. And that's why I said it takes quite a bit of training. Yeah, yeah. It's not an easy... You don't just get a collection of people to do it. You know, this is a... This is a... This needs experienced therapists, I think, really. Yeah. And um, I've, I've been part of these groups and I understand the power of them. And you, I think you the really did hit the nail on the head. And that the success of relational group processes or the success of the early ones from the other podcast I talked to, more individual style, um, is the therapist. Mm -hmm. The power and potency of the therapist. Yeah. So when you're saying an experienced therapist needs to do this, what, what kind of experience are you talking? The amount of time that they've been a therapist or the training that they've had, or does it does it both both okay definitely I yeah think they need that experience individually on a clinical level and i think they need also to have had training how to run a relational group process and i think they need to try it perhaps in the training first where they got some practice yeah it, it's, also, it's also a different way of thinking it's not an i it's not a them and an us it's a whole yeah it's a relational whole where respect, where transparency, whether an encouragement on taking ownership of the self are all prerequisites. Yeah, I like the sound of that, Bob. Yeah, I think it's, I was trying uh, uh, by Richard Erskine in this, and if people want to look at a very good article, on relational group process in the way that I'm talking about here, go to his website, which is all one world, I'm going to give all one word, integrativepsychotherapy.com. Go to his website, Richard Erskine's website, press on the left hand side articles, and up will pop about 50 articles. And I think it's the in number eight or ninth down, it's called something like a relational group process. 
And it's a very good article on the principles uh, behind what I'm talking about. And read it several times. The philosophy is very important in terms of the integrative whole I'm talking about. But I think it would be something enlightening people might find and they might like that way of doing groups and some of the principles and the um, discussions and the ideas are very uh, enlightening, I think. I'm going to go and read that article, Bob, because I'm really interested. In, you've you've tweaked my interest. It's a it's a important one, and I, I like talking about it. And also, I'll be doing it shortly myself. And I was thinking, as I was talking to you, you know, maybe I could have started this early in my career. I thought I was a well, I know I was a very good individual. So well, yeah, yeah, just backtrack a bit, Bob. When you're say you're saying I'm going to be starting this myself in a bit, what are you talking about starting? Oh, sorry, is that what I said? I didn't mean to say. That. I'm going to be running this group at the conference soon, and right. teach okay. Um, what can people find out about that? Oh, well, that's closed now. It's oh, on. Okay. It was on the Richard Erskine website because he runs the International Integrative Psychotherapy Association. And they have a really big biannual conference, uh, which is in Bilbao later in June sometime. Um, can't remember the day I'm going to now. I think it's June the 20th, I don't know, June the 12th or something like that. Um, so, and the, and the, the conference is full, but it's run every two years. So, okay. you know, it's a good thing. I have done a relation. I think I don't know how many years ago it was, and it was one of his conferences. So it may have been. It was way before the pandemic. I ran a, a group of probably eight people uh, in a relational group inquiry, and taught off it, and that was very uh, successful. So it's a it's a, um, a very powerful way of doing group therapy. Yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, I can see that. I. I... I quite like the the style of that. I quite like it. Yeah, I will definitely go and have a look at that um, article as well. Absolutely. And people listening to this, um, I hope you found it interesting. It took my thoughts about relational group process. And, and uh, please go back, back to the previous podcast we did last week, which explains the individual style group therapy that I talk about and all the different classifications and different styles of psychotherapy group because I certainly don't want the listeners to get caught up thinking there's only one style because there's many yeah and many of you might have been trained in many different modalities and many different ways to do those groups and that's fine that's completely fine because I'm a real fan of difference rather than right and wrong yeah yeah and it's a valid point that if people have just caught this episode they won't know that this is part two of a two-parter <laughs> Yeah, uh, which we added on because there was so much information. But I think it's a really good topic that, you know, it's not just individual therapy, that, you know, there are group therapies that you can get support in 101 different ways. And yeah. we're just exploring some yeah. of them. Yeah, and it's really interesting because things go in circles and waves and goodness knows what. I, when I first started uh, you know, my training, Transaction Analysis, in 1985, Psychotherapy groups were the vogue of the day. And I would say the 90, late 1980s and all through the 1990s, beginning of the 2000s, in Manchester, this is where I'm doing the podcast from, was very, very vogue for group psychotherapy and maybe also in the country and certainly in the transaction analysis movement. We go forward now to 2023 and in Manchester, in the transaction analysis community, I don't, I perhaps know two or three groups. Wow. So individualism and individual therapy has taken prime permission. And I wonder what that says about the culture in 2023 and the Maybe rise. Maybe we need to make a shift, Bob. Maybe we need to be introducing groups. I can see where there is a big need for groups. Mm. Yeah. Definitely, all those wonderful things I just talked about. So, yeah. 
It's his interest in 2023, especially in transaction analysis community. I don't hardly know any groups. We need a resurgence of groups, Bob. You need to get back in training. I'll sign up. I'll be the first one. I need to start again. Yes. Right. Okay. Until next week. So we'll probably do the, the tissues and teas in the therapy process next time. What's the, is that what it's called? Well, that we kind of put that one off and decided to do part two. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Tea and tissues in the psychotherapy room and the importance and understanding of the dynamics. Oh, absolutely. That'll be a great podcast. Yeah. So that's what we'll be doing next week. So until next time, Bob, thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed these last two episodes. Yeah, it's lovely to have the opportunity to talk about the different styles and purpose and structure and admin of groups. Brilliant. See you next time. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.